Good morning. Good evening, everyone. 90% of the data that we have access to today was created in the last two years. Every day, 2.5 quintillion bytes of data is added. That's 18 zeros. A billion only has nine zeros. So you can imagine the amount of data that's getting added every day. We're seeing similar addition of data when it comes to supply chain risk intelligence, when it comes to third party risk management. So how does one take this data, this intelligence that you're receiving on risk and actually make this actionable? We're very fortunate today to have a great resource that's joining us. Jim Routh is the former chief security officer of Mass Mutual, CVS, Aetna, He's led risk at organizations like JP Morgan Chase, KPMG, DTCC, American Express. And so he brings this 40 years of risk leadership in cybersecurity, in operational risk management, where he has helped build world-class risk management programs that not only leverage this intelligence, but use data science and automation to actually enable risk actions, create a very effective risk organization. Jim, welcome. Atul, thank you very much. Really happy to participate in this uh, in this forum. Wonderful, Jim. And again, thanks to the Global Risk Community for hosting this. And to give you a quick background, I am the chairman and founder of Supply Wisdom. Supply Wisdom provides continuous risk management and automated risk action for companies globally. So Jim, one of the things that I wanted to start with is, you know, very clearly, COVID accelerated the need or the visibility into how organizations needed to be better at third-party risk management and be more resilient. At the same time, if we think about our world today, we're seeing significant disruptions in business operations. And you have a couple of decades of experience in operational risk management. If you reflect on that journey, Jim, what have you experienced around business disruptions? Well, Atul, I'll tell you what comes to mind immediately from my perspective is I think about the fundamental mistakes <laughs> that I made uh, when I implemented my first third-party governance program, and it was, uh, it was close to 20 years ago. And I think about those mistakes because they're largely amplified by fundamental changes and the evolution of... Uh, risk in third party uh, governance. But, you know, mistake number one was clear. I had a one size fits all model. So I had thousands of third parties that provided different products, different services, and frankly had very different risk profiles. Yet, I had a one size fits all model where I was looking at assessment information that was consistent across all of them, usually in the form of a painful questionnaire that you know, inflicted friction on them and, and gave us something to work with. Uh, and then through the annual assessments uh, that we did, and most of the annual assessments involved a data center tour. Uh, and uh, I got sick and tired of uh, looking at data centers all day, but uh, uh, essentially, the, 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 those were fundamental mistakes. I didn't know it at the time. Uh, right. And certainly today, as we look back, you know, they, it seems silly, right? But, uh, but that's, that's kind of the way it was. And I would say that there are a lot of enterprises today that are still using those conventional controls in a one-size-fits-all model uh, and it's really, it's just not practical. And frankly, the irony is that if we think about operational risk, operational risk has always been data intensive, always. Right. And yet our uh, application of operational risk for third party governance uh, has, has, has really not been <laughs> data intensive. Uh, so, you know, that's a, another mistake, if you will, that I made, uh, you know, way back when. Today, we've got climate change driving really extreme weather events 
in different parts of the globe at any particular time that uh, have the potential for disrupting our supply chains. Uh, and that's, that's gonna continue to evolve going forward. Um, and so uh, the increase in nation state sponsored cybersecurity attacks that have a collateral effect on the a private enterprise today, that's also increasing. Uh, the volatility of financial markets increasing, right. political right. instability. These are all things that um, make third party governance from an operational risk perspective fundamentally different today. And we're using this legacy of yeah. control management procedures that are obsolete. Very, th thanks for that, Jim. So very clearly the need is rising. And so what I'd love to do is talk about challenges next, but before we do that, I, do, I want to remind the audience, please use the Q&A or the chat functions to ask, ask questions, or if you have any experiences you want to share, feel free to do that also. So Jim, let, let's talk about the challenges, right? So the need is very clear that when, when I think about risk management solutions in the market, and it's one of the reasons why I kind of jumped into this space to create a company was, I noticed the challenges with point in time assessments. They became stale very quickly. You talked about geopolitical, you know, very few companies really interlink their service provider risk to their location risk. And so they were not really monitoring location and COVID actually showed that quite a bit on how many companies were uh, ill-prepared. So Jim, when you think about your experience with risk management solutions that are inadequate, what, what else do you see as kind of limitations of these older risk management solutions? Well, I think fundamentally the inputs of, from a data perspective are static and right. uh, periodic. Uh, and so, and, and typically, I mean, this is kind of the way it works in most uh, third-party governance programs. You've got limited resources that support the risk analysis function, and they're struggling to keep up with the demand in the procurement pipeline. And there's always a few companies that happen to be the pet projects of the chairman and CEO. And of course, those get, you know, ratcheted up in priority and you're, you're quickly you know, putting your best resources on them to do and complete the security assessments that's part of the procurement process. And then of course you have uh, the other projects uh, that are required in the procurement process. They have a, a lower uh, kind of priority on a relative basis. And then by the time you, know, you, you, you get to all of them, which often you don't, <laughs> But by the time you do, then you have to do the recertification. And the recertification has to be <laughs> by risk, right? So you're the top vendors by risk, you have to have some sense of that. And of course you're using static, you know, and periodic data to make that determination. Uh, and, and, you know, the environment's very volatile. And then at the end of the day, no third party risk function has enough resources to do what's on their plate today, much less deal with emerging risk uh, that, uh, that evolves. So it's a zero sum game for most enterprises simply because they're resource starved trying to keep up with all the questionnaires that are going out. Yeah, Jim, I think that summarizes the challenges risk leaders face today really well. You know, interestingly for me, I know the audience is really there, Jim, to hear from you on solutions. So we're gonna to jump to that in a minute. It's interesting how kind of your journey, I remember it was 2017 at the Shared Assessment Summit, right? Where here I am um, in my early years in developing the risk management solution and talking about continuous monitoring. And here you were on stage talking about the evolution of risk management, how risk leaders needed to be focused and I felt like I no, no longer needed to evangelize because here's a leader that's already adopted it. Tell us a little bit about how did you get to that conclusion in terms that you needed to move the model even as early as 2016, 2017? Well, one of the first things that I did uh, is recognize that 
operational risk is a data intensive process. And, um, and, and frankly, third party risk management for uh, cybersecurity and for resilience, just business resilience needed to be a data intensive process. We needed much more uh, effective data and real time or close to uh, real time data. So, you know, that was absolutely, you know, critical. Um, what also kind of, there were seminal events that happened. There was a supply chain poisoning that took place where uh, the fundamental supply chain disrupted many, many businesses uh, by planting malware and spreading that malware through the supply chain uh, that really brought many businesses uh, to, the, you know, to basically un unable to operate. Now, this sounds very familiar because all of us have been reading about solar winds, but what I'm talking about was not Petya, which was yeah. exactly the same thing. In fact, it was initiated by a nation state uh, attacking another uh, state and the collateral damage involved major companies. Merck, as one example, lost 15,000 servers that were compromised, bricked, and un, you know, just totally uh, non-functional in 90 seconds. Now, no human can respond in that kind of time frame in, in the enterprise. So we all kind of woke up to the fact that we needed data in a real time, near as close to real time as possible across a number of dimensions. And we needed not only to be able to analyze that data, but we actually needed to turn that data into some action through automation. And that, that gave us an ability to take the risk intelligence in close to a real time fashion and create specific responses that were automated, allowing the scarce resources for business resilience across the enterprise and third party risk management to then focus on where the highest risks were at that point in time, recognizing that that change. And it, it was a bit of a, it's a game changer. And, and so when we break out of our conventional constraints around a one size fits all model driven by annual assessments, we can start to look at multiple data feeds across many dimensions and let that trigger a series of automated events and that connecting the intelligence in, in real time to the automation of workflow, we actually free up resource to be more thoughtful about where they apply their time and how, uh, and how they uh, implement controls. So Jim, this is, this is really good. What I'm, I'm gonna do over the next few minutes with you is let's, let's pick these threads one at a time. So we'll start with focus on continuous monitoring and kind of the scope of risk one needs to look at. And I love your thoughts on that. The second piece is then talk about kind of how do you actually use data science to take a continuous model and make sense out of that. And then finally, how do you make sure that you can actually automate these risk actions? Like, like you said, in many cases like Petya or not Petya or SolarWinds, impossible for humans to take that level of action. Fair. Yeah, so let's start with the uh, the first is um, there are multiple um, data elements that we wish to absorb, especially, you know, the reality is the level of interdependence from between the enterprise and third, fourth and fifth parties uh, has increased exponentially uh, in the last decade. And so we're much more dependent upon third parties. So we have to think about the fact that there's a community of third party, fourth party, fifth party providers, and we're all interdependent. Uh, and so we have to think in terms of 
applying information through multiple sources. I don't think there's a one size fits all model. I think there are multiple sources uh, across different dimensions. And then the, to the degree that we can respond to the inputs with, instead of every single action requiring a human to provide context and then determine what the appropriate uh, action is, if we can create a risk score for each entity fed by multiple sources, that risk score, which is just a numerical representation of an event. And, right. and by the way, I'm, 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 I'm touching on some fundamentals of data science that we all learned whenever we took statistics when we were in either high school or as an undergrad, we all learned you can take any event and put it on an X and Y axis, right? So we could yeah. represent numerically any event. Now that's kind of a cornerstone for uh, any kind of operational risk management capability because now that we can represent that numerically, we can take multiple inputs across multiple disciplines and come up with a single risk score for that entity. And that risk score, because it's a numeric representation of the risk at a point in time, we can establish a threshold. The threshold could be in, uh, on a scale of one to 100 if I said 70, was the threshold. I could say if I have a score above 70 or above, then I'm gonna automatically take a specific action. And I'm gonna trigger that action based on when that score goes above 70. And I'm gonna automate the workflow to initiate that action. Now, what I've done is I've eliminated the need for the human to digest the information, put context around it, and then figure out what action to take and take that action. I've eliminated all of that. So now in real, close to real time, I'm triggering an automated event based on a change to the risk score. And all of that is happening with no human involvement whatsoever. And the more I can apply treatment in an automated way, it frees up my scarce resources in the enterprise to analyze the entire workflow and decide where to apply the human to the establishing the context and uh, assessing risk. Um, and that's a game changer because it means that you can increase the breadth of your coverage from an operational risk perspective for more and more third parties without adding critical essential resources with high level of skill. Um, and so you're, you have a whole model that's far more effective and it's a better utilization of resource. And that's kind of the end game. That's what we want to do. We want to not only increase the scope of third, fourth, and fifth parties looking across multiple dimensions of resilience for the enterprise and ultimately use our knowledge and our capabilities from a resource perspective to help the community members by providing them some of that information and encouraging them to take the right steps, which improves resilience uh, across the entire enterprise. Thank you for that, Jim. Jim, I think it's important to also reinforce that while this sounds aspirational, it's actually being done. You, you put into place, we put into place. So it's important to recognize that. Jim, I wanna, I wanna kind of take a step back for a little bit. Um, you talked about the kind of the starting point happens to be near real time continuous data. And I wanted to just poll the audience because it's interesting for me, even today when I have conversations with risk leaders, sometimes they'll tell me 
that, oh yes, their model is continuous. And then when I probe further, I realize they're using the once a year as actually saying that's continuous. And I think what we mean here is not a quarterly or a once a year being continuous, but it's being near real time, all the time, live monitoring. So the question I wanted to ask the audience, and I'm gonna open up a poll for everybody to respond to is, do you continuously monitor those third parties? So let's limit it to third parties at this point in time, not the fourth or fifth or end parties. Do you continuously monitor those third parties that represent the highest risk for the organization? So you'll have three choices, yes, no, or it's in future plan. And I'm making the poll live for you at this point in time. So I encourage all of you to please respond. And then I'm gonna ask Jim to kind of give us his thoughts on what he sees in the responses from you. We have about half the people have voted. So Jim, um, as you see the poll, I'm gonna, I'm gonna close the polls in about 30 seconds. So Jim, as you see the poll and I'm gonna bring it up, What, what's your reaction to these uh, poll results that, you know, 36% say, yes, they monitor continuously, but there's about 64% that either don't or do have a plan, but they're not doing it currently. Yeah, the reality is I'm encouraged. <laughs> I'm encouraged because I thought the numbers uh, for those that, uh, that have, have kind of evolved their programs uh, to do this um, were, would be lower. Uh, so I'm actually encouraged by these numbers. Um, the fact that 32% uh, have it in the in terms of their future plans uh, and 16% uh, and uh, or 36% uh, are doing it today, that's, that's actually very encouraging. Um, it, it, you know, the reality is um, we in enterprises um, and especially larger enterprises, it takes time. It takes time to fundamentally change behaviors and practices. Even if you have, you know, outstanding data sources, just connecting the data sources to an understanding of the, the data science of measuring risk uh, with multiple inputs and then automating the actual actions from that, these, we're talking about changing workflows across large enterprises, nothing happens right. overnight. So I'm actually somewhat encouraged uh, by these uh, numbers. Now I'm naturally skeptical because I come from cybersecurity, right? But uh, I'm, I'm a, you know, a little bit optimistic about these numbers and uh, I feel encouraged by them. Wonderful. So, so Jim, you, you just said something, you know, you have a background in risk, uh, in operational risk, but also over the last couple of decades, uh, also focused on cybersecurity. Often when we're having conversations uh, with risk leaders, particularly CISOs, there are a few that we hear from that talk about that I need to expand my risk aperture. It's no longer enough for me to just look at cyber. Talk to us about First, why CISOs and risk leaders really need to widen their risk aperture? And then I have a couple of follow-up questions on ESG. Yeah, so we talked uh, earlier, a tool about kind of the drivers of change uh, and really across uh, enterprises globally, uh, you know, weather and climate, uh, you know, uh, market volatility, political unrest, uh, the fact that we have so men, such a large percentage of the population globally uh, that are uh, migration or uh, migrating uh, as a result of uh, weather or political uh, events. And we're going to see that increase. And of course, these are in developing areas. And where are the lowest cost labor resources that we're trying to uh, leverage? You know, they're, they're, they're in developing countries. So, um, there's a whole number of uh, factors that ch uh, just change, fundamentally change risk uh, uh, profiles. Uh, and we have to be able to respond to that in, in, in real time. Uh, and so um, it takes 
just like any implementation of new uh, infrastructure, process and workflow, it takes time to, to digest that for an enterprise. Um, but the, uh, over time, what happens is you can do, you the enterprise can do much more with less, much more with fewer resources. Um, but you need to put the, the implementation effort in place. And so that may you know, be an investment of resource in the short term, might have to invest in some software to do that uh, and, and, and then go through the engineering of uh, the data science connected to the automation. Uh, but the end result of that will be far uh, greater coverage, much more responsive uh, capability at a lower cost simply because the, um, the labor uh, cost will be so much lower. Right. So Jim, very clearly you're kind of following this whole path from getting more intelligence and the need for greater intelligence, not just cyber, but really this wider aperture. Uh, so let me stay with this topic and I'm going to jump onto data science and automation right after this. So we look at the, the, the new US administration, right? And so January 27th, an executive order focused on climate change. February 24th, if I remember right, the right date, executive order on supply chains and the poisoning of supply chains. Uh, and then the SEC on March 3rd with a directive that they're gonna look at ESG disclosures more so this year than ever before. Let's talk about ESG, Jim. You know, you talked about geopolitical and weather. Do you see ESG again as a purview that risk management needs to adopt, especially as they look at third party risk management? Or is this something that you see kind of a movement that procurement or somebody else ought to be dealing with? No, this is clearly in the operational risk sphere. So, uh, and frankly, for third party governance, um, most of what we do touches or involves uh, procurement. So some of those automated treatments that I was talking about in, involve procurement. I'll give you a specific example of that. Uh, and this was implemented uh, at two, uh, two companies that did uh, previously uh, and, and it got really good results. So the first thing we did is um, whenever a risk score uh, was uh, triggered and, and, and increased significantly. And we were focused initially on cybersecurity risk. Um, that risk score included something called responsiveness. And it was a subjective measure. And it's basically if, um, if we and the enterprise sent out information about something like a solar winds kind of uh, event, uh, and we were seeking information from our uh, community, those members that shared that information actually got a higher response rate or higher response score uh, as one of the indicators of risk uh, uh, for the end. And a higher response score was actually a lower risk. So, uh, so the ultimate risk score went down when the responsiveness was high. Conversely, those enterprises that never responded got a higher risk score uh, as a result of that as a, a net effect. And in some cases, if the risk score triggered above a 4.0 on a scale of one to five, um, we would automate a workflow process through procurement where we would send a generic RFP out to two other suppliers that provided the same type of service or product as the vendor that triggered the risk score. And the two other suppliers would respond and the relationship owner um, could choose to do, could ignore the RFPs or could actually engage the other two suppliers to see if there's a better way of improving the service. All of this triggered largely based on the responsiveness of the uh, third party. Now, what happened is 
um, nine times out of 10, the verbal uh, word got out that uh, we were going to market looking for new services. And the vendor that had the low response score um, discovered this, saw that, oh, well, I guess they're serious about it and immediately improved their level of responsiveness. And all of it was triggered through workflow that didn't require a human to do anything. <laughs> it was literally an email that went out with a generic uh, RFP and uh, nobody had to touch or do anything. It was totally automated. And that's an example of, uh, of kind of uh, risk triggered um, right. uh, events driving automation that didn't require any labor that actually uh, over time uh, reach sustainable behavior or influence sustainable behavior in this case for the, uh, the third party. So, um, so that's an example of this. And it's all based on this notion and you have it on the screen now where there are different dimensions and categories of risk. Uh, and you can you know, add responsiveness as an example but you can look at financial risk, people risk, client risk, you know, region risk, geographic risk, uh, and uh, all of that factors into a score at a point in time uh, that's representative. And of course, if you look at that across the entire portfolio, you can look at the portfolio score, uh, which is an aggregate of all the vendors within that portfolio. And if you decide to divide your portfolio into types of products and services, each segment can have its own risk score uh, and you could trigger actions based on changes to that risk score as opposed to, uh, let's find out how many have to recertify their annual risk assessment, you know, based on uh, doing a data center tour that's absolutely useless today because everybody's <laughs> using cloud computing. So. Um, that's the beauty of this. Jim, that was, a, that was actually a great example, the, the whole sourcing example you use, because too often when you start talking to people about risk action automation, their mind goes very quickly to patch management, leak credential and others, and not recognizing that when you think about a wider risk aperture, financial, ESG, ge geopolitical and others, they didn't many of these areas, there's a number of actions that one can actually automate. Jim, interesting, I'd love, to, I'd love for you to comment on this. So one of the things that we saw companies do when the solar winds breach happened, that as the third parties were disclosing that they had been breached, what we saw was that companies could take the risk profile of the breached third party and use the risk scores to run those risk scores against their entire universe of third parties that were in the system and be able to identify who was at similar risk because they happen to have very similar risk scores. What do you think about that approach in terms of leveraging data science? Uh, it, that, you know, that's nirvana. Uh, I'll give you a, a specific example uh, that, that is factual. Uh, and uh, when COVID hit, uh, it was probably mid-March uh, uh, last year. And um, one of the first things I recognized is that um, our uh, offshore suppliers that were dealing with customer uh, information um, had to, uh, by uh, mandate uh, in, in their countries, uh, had to work from home. Now, financial services as an industry, uh, which has typically mature third-party governance programs on a relative basis, just largely due to regulation and, uh, and, and, uh, and breadth of risk, uh, they've never, no one in financial services ever encouraged a third party to encourage resources to work from home. Right. Um, and the reason for that uh, is that when uh, a third party offshore resource is working in a development environment or a, a call center environment, there are other people around. And those other people around can observe behavior and, um, and they can actually enforce behavior. So for example, if I'm a third party 
and I take out my phone and I hold it up to the screen to take a picture, if I'm in a call center, I may not be allowed to have my phone. I Absolutely. may have to put it into a locker, right? Um, or if my uh, supervisor is sitting across the table, he's gonna say, Jim, what are you doing, <laughs> right? So there's an, an inherent uh, control that's applied just through socialization, right? Well, now if I'm working from home, which I have to do for health reasons, it's the right thing to do, I still have access on my screen to sensitive customer information. And now I have a way, a vehicle for taking it off network that's, that's not monitored and there's no control for it. Now look, right. we uh, at, at the company I was uh, at previously, uh, at Mass Mutual, we told our third parties, have people work from home. <laughs> Absolutely. Put infrastructure in place, including, you know, in, uh, pay for their last mile if that's what you need to do, but d do the right thing from a health perspective. Now, while you're doing that, I need your help because we, this is unprecedented. We don't have any controls for this. So we brainstormed together some potential controls. We came up with one, was it great? No, it wasn't great. Was it better than nothing? Yes, it was better than <laughs> nothing. And so what we said is, give us a name. This is the enterprise asking the third party, give us a name of every employee that you've uh, asked to work from home that has access to this customer information uh, and give us their IP address for their home network. Yeah. And um, uh, we had five and about, uh, I'll say five to 600 people in that category, uh, in that segment and, uh, and five companies. And so we talked to the five companies. Four of the uh, five companies uh, said, absolutely, be, be happy to do that. As a matter of fact, we're going to notify them that we're doing this. So they're fully aware of that. And of course the enterprise and us in our case, we said, great, that's, that's a prophylactic right, right there in terms of that control because they're aware that we're yeah. gonna take their information, share it with a third party uh, Intel provider. And if they find dark web activity, that's typically indicator of fraud, uh, they're gonna uh, notify us and we're gonna notify the supplier who's gonna notify the individual. And, and everybody in that chain became aware that this was going to be implemented. The, the one of the five vendors said, no way we're doing that. Uh, and uh, you know, for privacy reasons. Um, so we implemented this over, it might've been six or seven days, right, later. We actually implemented it for all five, sorry, all four. And the fifth one, a week later, decided that they were gonna throw their lot in and say, oh, you know, we're willing to do that now because we see others are kind of following the lead. Now, the extension of the attack surface that was the result of an event, in this case, the pandemic, um, triggered an increase in risk that was managed within a couple of weeks uh, of, uh, of implementation because of the community. And, and everybody recognized that it was a different ball game with a different set of rules. Well, look, those same uh, vendors today are still having their folks work at home. They're right. healthy because they can work at home. They're enabled. They're not, they're, they're uh, uh, you know, they're not uh, destitute economically because they can work. And so far we've had no major, you know, I don't have uh, right. real time data, but we've had no major incidents as a result of it. And that's a way for a community to come together and deal with a change in the uh, attack surface, you know, right. all triggered from, uh, from the risk. So Jim, that's a great idea of adding another data source. In this case, the IP addresses of those work from home team members. Jim, I want to dig a little bit deeper into the conversation we were having regarding, uh, regarding automating risk actions. So uh, 
let's let's follow a couple of examples. So you know, these three are actual alerts that that have happened recently regarding certain third parties. The first one is a financial risk alert about a drop in credit rating. The next one is a geopolitical alert regarding a weather pattern. And then the final one in this case was uh, regarding a patch management update. So Jim, talk to us about a little bit deeper. You know, these are some examples I know that you, know, you and I have talked about. How does one actually start a program like this? And then secondly is how do you then scale, it, scale that to apply across these different risk categories? Yeah, so um, the, the first place that I would start is um, looking at the universe of third parties for an enterprise and deciding how to categorize the types of products and services from a risk standpoint into uh, specific categories. So I, uh, in, uh, in the last two enterprises that I've uh, worked in had eight, uh, I think the first time I had seven categories and then the second time I had eight categories. I don't think there's a right number of categories. I think what you have to do is group them. So for example, offshore, we talked about offshore uh, service providers with access to sensitive customer information. That's a category. What does it mean? It means that that category has a specific set of controls based on the risk profile of those in that category. All right. Now, high risk software, commercial software providers, that's a different category. They look nothing like offshore third party services, right? They're different. They have a different risk profile. There's a different set of control requirements that they have. Um, and they're a product firm versus a service firm, right? So, you, and by the way, one of the categories that you need to think about today in light of solar winds, uh, which uh, was supply chain poisoning, uh, one of the categories you have to think about is repository management SaaS services. So you may have a, a category of SaaS services or SaaS service providers that are used by the enterprise. And maybe you have some way of determining the highest risk relative to the data that's shared. But somewhere in that uh, domain, if you will, that subcategory, you've got to have repo providers, GitHub, GitLab, uh, BitLocker, uh, or Bitbucket. The, these are uh, what developers are using to access open source uh, code components. And they're joining into these communities through a SaaS service that, oh, by the way, that SaaS service today is probably not part of your third party governance program, but should be part of your third party governance program as one of the lessons learned from uh, the solar winds breach, right? So, and maybe you want some specific controls in place like identity access management controls that's yeah. unique for them. That becomes a category or a domain. So figure out in your universe, how many domains that you want from a risk standpoint, design the specific controls for that category and then measure the compliance to those controls as one of the factors that goes into the risk score for the vendor, for the individual entity in that category. And then ultimately add data and as many sources of near real-time data as you can so that you have multiple dimensions of risk that are all feeding into that uh, risk score for the vendor that ultimately then you use to establish thresholds and trigger action. Uh, so the basis is really universe, subcategories based on risk, control, specific control requirements for each category, uh, then the vendor risk score, which is a composite of the categories plus other real-time sources of data that you have, and then the trigger to automation of workflow that's non-human dependent that closes the loop. And then the humans step back and look at the whole thing and say, where do we need to focus our time? Yeah. So Jim, it's, 
one of the key takeaways from the conversation you and I had last week for me was, you know, when you think about supply chain poisoning, and I actually like that perspective because when you start thinking like that, it makes you spend time and effort recognizing where in my supply chain, in my third party delivery, can part of that supply chain be poisoned? Just like the example that you that you talked about, where is that code that you, your teams are leveraging? Where is that coming from? And the probability of that potentially being poisoned. So it kind of makes you rethink your attack surface from location to cyber to financial, because you're really thinking about how can something be poisoned or challenged? Yeah, so um, in, this, in the solar winds um, thing, and look, there's been a lot that's been written about it. You've read about it. You've consumed a lot of information about it. I'm just gonna just make it very, very simple. Um, the threat actor, who's a sophisticated nation state sponsored threat actor, uh, very familiar with uh, working in the Ukraine and uh, in Russia, uh, was trained as a criminal uh, and also had development expertise. Uh, what they did is they used a password, SolarWinds123. Uh, now, my guess is all of you recognize that's a simple password. And that password was probably guessed. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's how the penetration happened in GitHub. But the real skill that was applied, uh, and this comes from the development experience, is that the um, sunburst, which is the back door that was malware that was created, was made to look just like all of the other code components in the repo. Yeah. So it didn't stand out at all. It looked exactly like a solar winds professional a developer put this together and then it got packaged it through the pipeline for distribution as an update. And the stealthiness part of this was the skill and expertise of camouflaging the software to look like it came from the development team. And they bought it, they, they believed it, right? And what I just described uh, sounds very simple, it is, um, but it's, it's highly likely, like it, it's very possible to do this. Look, there are limitations to passwords. We've known about that for a long time. And once you've defeated a binary control like that, you're in, <laughs> you're trusted. Right. So as right. long as you act and behave as expected, you can stay kind of in stealth mode, which is what happened here. So the reality is, you know, what do we take away as an enterprise? Number one, apply better identity access management controls and password complexity to uh, the DevOps teams that are setting up accounts in GitHub and GitLab. Uh, and we know how to do that. That's, there's, no, there's no mystery there. We know how to do that. Second is the SaaS provider that's doing repo management, well, it's a third party. <laughs> Make it part of your third party governance program. By the way, it wasn't before, right? We, we never heard of solar winds before. I never heard of it before, right? <laughs> and, we, and my company was using it, right? Shame on me. They weren't part of my third party governance program. Do that today. The third thing, which is if the first two fail and you're a victim of supply chain poisoning, again, which is, has a pretty high probability, uh, especially now that the criminals all are sharing information about how to do this, right? So the third thing is a little bit more um, uh, innovative, I guess, but also there's some risk associated with that in terms of the technology it's new, which is workload, runtime, protection. And there's six companies today that offer that capability. There'll be, you know, 16 over the next uh, <laughs> several years. Uh, it's, a, it's a thing, it's a category of thing. Uh, uh, and it basically is using some machine learning algorithms to uh, monitor workloads. And when workloads do things that are break a behavioral pattern, again, we're using data science here, uh, then there's either an alert or a block. Uh, you choose. You can set it up to alert or you can set it up to block. And this is runtime protection. So if a backdoor gets installed, similar to what happened in SolarWinds, 
in your workload, whether it's running on the cloud or running on prem, it doesn't matter. You you run these agents, if you will, pieces yeah. of software. Uh, and I encourage all of you to try out using these capabilities and get better at it and basically start out with alerting and then eventually uh, you know, go into uh, prevent or block mode. Uh, and, uh, and you know, this is ultimately how we're gonna have more confidence in our software right. supply chain. So Jim, you know, all these activities, some of course automation, but we talked about moving to continuous monitoring, expanding the risk aperture, leveraging data science. And so one thing we recognize is while risk manager is a hot job as Bloomberg said a few months ago, the, but the amount of work, the tax that's being put on these risk professions is rising. So one of the polls that we wanted to quickly do was for all the risk leaders on the call, when you think about your organization, do you have enough people to meet the current operational risk requirements? Yes, no, or you are planning to do that as, as Jim is recommending and we are recommending is to use automation to be able to manage that. So please, to the audience, please answer the question. Do you feel you have enough resources to meet the operational risk requirement? I'm gonna let it be open for another 10 seconds. And then Jim, love for you to comment on kind of your personal experience and compared to what you are seeing from the audience. So let me end the poll and Jim, I'm gonna share the results. Yeah, so about 20% of people say, yes, they have enough resources and about 12.2% of that 20% are delusional. <laughs> <laughs> now that's, that's Jim's opinion. Right. Clear that, that, and, and there's no statistical research to back that up. Uh, but I, but, uh, but I'm, I guess I'm not surprised by 53% uh, not having enough resources. I never had enough resources. And frankly, one of the hardest things to do, and this was related to a question that uh, Ed, I think, raised earlier, is uh, right. you really have to, um, to the enterprise and all your stakeholders, you're the champion of uh, uh, operational risk and third-party governance. Uh, uh, I'm making that assumption. You basically have to say, look, we're going to make some investment. Uh, and the reason we're making some investment is because we're decreasing the unit cost of uh, our ability to support third-party risk going forward. Now, don't say anything about risk, right? Don't say anything about uh, threats or anything like that. It muddies the water. Just very simply, you're going to provide some investment in terms of software capital and people and you're going to redesign processes using data science. And the outcome, the reason you're doing it uh, is to get a lower unit cost uh, for your uh, program. And that lower unit cost for, comes from fewer people. And, and, uh, and it may take you 18 months, uh, 24 months uh, to do that. Um, but that's the outcome. That's what you want to do. You want to actually shrink the amount of operational costs in your third party governance program. At the same time, the risks are going up. But I don't want you to focus on risk because you're speaking a language that all your stakeholders understand. Invest money today to get a better return that's sustainable tomorrow. That's the formula. That's exactly what you use. Now, inside of that, you're building this data science foundation. You're using some software and data feeds in real time to give you lots of attribute information. And you're then connecting the outcomes from a risk standpoint to the automation. And once you have that implemented, you can do all of this with fewer resources than you're doing today. And the fewer resources you have are going to love their jobs a lot more because they're going to feel like they're making a material difference in improving risk management. But I don't want you to tell the enterprise that that's why you're doing this. That's an outcome 
The reason why you're doing this is to lower unit cost for your programs. And the reason I'm encouraging you to do this, it's easy to get money in an enterprise to do this. Don't tell anybody, <laughs> but it's easy. <laughs> you just have to stick to that formula. And you've got to bring these functions along with you, Jim. Yeah, they were, frankly, operational risk, third-party uh, governance, they're one and the same. Like the, it doesn't matter how you're organized, you're birds of a feather. You, uh, and then of course, the procurement process uh, and you know, ways of making that more effective and efficient, um, you know, you've got lots of stakeholders that have a vested interest in this outcome uh, and it benefits uh, the entire enterprise. Thank you for that, Jim. So Jim, I know we addressed a number of questions uh, from our attendees today. There's many that we may not be able to address today. What I'll do, Jim, is I'll reach out to you and hopefully get the answers and we can post them for everybody. But maybe to end this session, Jim, I just wanted to kind of reinforce certain messages you said. And if you feel, please feel free to add to that. I think we started with talking about, think about what you can automate as, as you are bringing in continuous monitoring across a very comprehensive or a wide risk aperture. And then ensuring by using data science and, and automation mechanisms that you're actually reducing the noise so that your risk professionals are truly focused on this integrated view that they are getting, automation taking care of a significant number of those actions, but the risk professionals being focused on key escalation activities. Jim, any final words you want to leave the audience with as they take this journey that you have just kind of explained, which you have done twice before? Yes, um, there's a life cycle here that you have to recognize, and it's very similar. You've seen this uh, across other dimensions uh, across the enterprise uh, and may, maybe have seen it in third party governance as well. The more data you have, especially uh, near real-time data, the more ideas and thoughts you have about what to do with that data. So be careful and don't get caught in a trap where you're consuming data, providing context for that data, and thinking about all of the ways to use that data and maybe other data sources that you'd like to use. Until you connect the risk driver to the workflow automation, you don't have a way of realizing the economic outcome that you're seeking. So that part is really important and so as you find more data across multiple dimensions, which gives you lots of information that you can respond and react to, be sensitive to the fact that you wanna connect as much through automation of the workflow as possible, because that's where you're gonna be able to realize the benefits. That's where you're gonna be able to shrink the, re the unit cost for the program and expand the coverage. If you don't do that, then you're just feeding more data into your current resource scarce team. Um, so that third step is the part that's the most essential to realizing the business benefits broadly across the enterprise. Jim, you're, you've absolutely reinforced, like I said, what Bloomberg said, risk manager is a hot job. And I think the way, the journey that you described enables risk managers to actually deliver significant value to their organization when it comes to resilience, and most importantly, the protection of that revenue that these companies are aspiring to. To the audience, once again, thank you to Jim. This recording will be available soon on crowisdom.com. And, and as I said before, we'll make sure that the questions that were not answered are answered and available to you on both Jim's LinkedIn and also Supply Wisdom's LinkedIn. Thank you everyone. And I look forward to our next session. Thank you, Jim.